I said, okay. Went to the man and said, what kind of church were you been going all these years? I asked him that question. What kind of church were you been going? You know, we need to get married right now. And then uh, as I'm putting pressure for the marriage, the Lord spoke to me. That's not your answer. Gotta let him go. I said, no, I love him. Been together 10 years. Can't tell me, let him go. I can't. He's my life. He's everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Wow. I began to pray. My pastor taught me about fasting and prayer. He taught me about hearing the voice of God. Mm-hmm. He taught me all these good things about the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So now I begin now to rely on the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Put aside a specific time every 3 a.m. Got up and locked the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Sit on the floor, put a towel there, and read the Bible. When you hear from God, talk to me. What is this? This nonsense. I gotta let go of this man. It was hard. It was hard. He said, He's not for you. I said, No, I'm not gonna let him go. I love him. This is it for me. This is the last man I want in my life. I don't want to let him go. One day, I traveled with him to London. His niece was getting married. After the wedding, we're coming back with three of us, his best friend and I. We got in the plane. We had our food, we ate. His best friend was having fever, covered himself, went to sleep, watch, I watched a movie, I was tired. I laid my head on his lap, went to sleep. Some time later, maybe 30 minutes or hour, he took a pillow, put my head on the pillow and says, does that feel better? I say, yes, feels better. A second later, I felt my head on his, on his lap. I felt a move like this. I say, are you okay? He didn't say nothing. I say, are you okay? He didn't say nothing. I lift up my head to look at him. His hand was like this, his mouth wide open, and he was gone. Oh. I screamed loud. I screamed loud. I woke up his friend. I said, Kamaro, he was a Nigerian guy. I said, Kamaro, Kamaro, look at Kamaro. And then he woke up, pushed me aside, and went on his face and slapped him. Bum, 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 bum. And I bowed while he's doing that. I screamed loud. I need a doctor. I need a doctor. I need a doctor, please. I need a doctor. And the steward rushed in the plane down where we were, and there were three doctors in the plane. They pushed me along the side. I just crossed them on the hallway, like right there, and held the sits right there, find the strength. I said, Lord Jesus, not now when I know you. Not now. If you don't want him with me, don't kill him. If you don't want him with me, don't kill him. You cannot kill him. You already have me. What am I going to tell my family? What am I going to tell my children? What am I going to tell his family? Don't kill him. Don't do it. Don't do it. I began crying. I went up in the back of the plane. I said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. When I didn't know you, you didn't do stuff like this. Now I know you. Please, give him his life back. A little doctor comes and they brought all the equipment. That's when you know there's serious equipment in the plane. Jump start to give him CPR, everything. Jump start to say, he's gone, he's gone. No, no pulse, no breathing, he is gone, he is gone. I was crying, crying, I have no strength. And I don't know what to do, we in the air. I hear the pilots say we are waiting for the FAA announcement to tell us where to land because we cannot continue in the US with the dead body in the planes because we don't know what happened to this person who died. Okay. To avoid contamination, we need to land. Mm-hmm. Oh, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Here we are, just praying. A lady comes to me and say, I'm a pastor, can I pray with you? I say, are you asking? I do need prayer. She stood there, sat there, was sat on the floor, she prayed. She prayed with me. She said, I'm a pastor, I'm a Baptist pastor. I said, fine, whatever pastor you are. I need that prayer right now. 
I'm in Jesus' intervention right now. So, here we are. Some minute later, he's back, he's back. I said, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He's back, he's back, he's back. He came back. Because we were sitting on the, in, the, in the middle aisle. So they move everybody, they lie and let him down. Came back, took him a minute, opened his eyes. And the doctor was like, where are you coming from? I said, what am I doing here lying like this? I said, where did you go? He said, all I know, I heard somebody calling my name. Yeah. And then they fade away at some point. I didn't hear no more. So we were to land in New York. He landed in New York, the ambulance was already there. So we didn't land anymore because he woke up. So the FAA just let us continue to the US. So in New York, the ambulance was at the door getting, waiting for us, at the door of the plane. The guy got up and walked like nothing happened. He walked like nothing happened. And these people who came to guide us and like, is this the man you say he was dead in the plane? Say so yes, it's him. So okay, we need all these doctors to give us a report. The doctor already had the report ready, gave it to them. They read it and said, no, that's not true. These doctors, there were two doctors of the US, one from Connecticut, one from Bethesda, and the uh, other doctor was from London. Mm. And this man did not believe the three doctors. Mm. I said, okay, ma'am, you're the wife. Let us hear from you. My report was not different from the doctor. He said, oh, it's a wife in emotion. Mm. Okay, the friend, let's talk. He gave his report, oh, no, it's the family in distress. <laughs> so they didn't believe any report. They took him to the hospital. They screamed him from head to toe. Put him in every equipment that the hospital has in New York. We spent the night there. Because you're not going in no plane because we were going to catch connection to Washington. They're not going to take you no plane until the doctor gave the letter that this man is fine. After all the tests, they did not even find a seizure, nothing. Mm. The guy is quick and clean, healthy like a baby. Mm. So we came back to Washington. You can imagine how stressful that was. Even in the night when he sleeps, I have to wake him up, make sure he's not dead. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I was so stressed for months because of that. And now I begin to look into what God told me. I need to let go. Mm. I said, God, give me the strength. Help me. At that moment, my businesses were drying up. I had to rely on him to eat and to drink. He's the one paying insurance on my car, doing everything. And now God said, let go. Who's going to pay for the mortgage? In fact, I can't be living in this house. I have to move. How am I going to do this? So. You put one and one is not giving. And everything, every indication is for you to stick with him. So you're serving God, he's filled in you. You have a choice to make, you have two big men in your life. I have a God in this man. I'm in the middle, I have to make a choice. Either I want God or I want him. And that's the situation where Jesus put me. Choose him or me. As I'm reading my Bible mm -hmm. every day, spending that time in the presence of God, fasting, praying. And one morning, I went to my knee and I said, God, you are the creator. You are the creator. Your words say you created heaven and earth and everything within. Mm -hmm. I chose you today. My problem is just a grain of sand in the seashore. I know you'll take care of me. I refused to look at all the dilemma and problem I was going through. I faced Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And a week later, I told him, I said, you and I are both going our separate ways. Mm -hmm. So in between times, because I told God, I'm not going to let him go, I'll, I'll post forward back. God began to expose him to make it easy for me to make a choice. Mm -hmm. We live with people, we don't know them. Mm. I'm talking to believers in this place. If you're not married, don't rush to that marriage. 
Mm. You've got to know who's your wife, who's your husband, who you married. Mm. You will regret that. You've got to make sure God is the God that speaks. Yeah. You can hear his voice for that man or that woman. If you rush in, you might be marrying a viper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't even know it. This man, my house, lots of witchcraft in every corner of the house. I was living in for all these 10 years. Mm -hmm. When I said to God, I'm not living him. God would come in a dream and say, go in the closet to this place. Just put your hand down. I'm, I wake up in the morning and say, what's the closet? I'll go. I'll set my hand. Go to mm. I'll catch a bottle. I'll bring it out. <gasps> oh my God. Oh. What is this? Oh. I'll put it outside. He comes, what is this? Oh, well, nothing. Or something. Mm -hmm. I take it and put it in the trash. And God, every day, showing me things in the house. The things that are removed out of their house by the Spirit of the Most High God. It's God that showed me things under the bed, things everywhere in the house, where you turn, in the garage. I don't know how many of those thoughts were buried. It's only by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that I, I plead in the, in, in the house of those things that are unseen to be destroyed by the power of the Most High God. I remove things in the house. My children at some point say, Mommy, please, when you see those things, please don't show it to us anymore. We're going to run away from this house. And my son said, Ma, I even saw some stuff in the garage. Let me go show it to you. Mm. I went in the garage and I found stuff. Mm. Okay. Did I say we're going separate ways? Yeah. At this point, when I told him he's going separate ways, a few days later, he comes and tells me, Oh, I just had a call from Nigeria that my father is very sick. He's in the hospital. He's probably not going to make it. They want me to come urgently to Nigeria. I just knew what he was up. I said, really? He said, yes. Okay, when are you going? He said, I'm going 10 days time. I said, that's okay. And immediately when he announced his trip to Nigeria, I took on fasting. I said, I am fasting until you go, until you come back. I start fasting every single day. Staying in prayer for the protection of my life and my children. Mm. I just stay in prayer because I already knew this man is up to no good. Mm. And the day he left, that night I had a dream. I was walking in the mall with him and I was pulling a suitcase. Mm. And he was in the escalator. He was wearing a chain with a bottle on his chain. I was down trying to come up. He opened that bottle about to pour that powder over me. I said, I cancel that in Jesus' name, in a dream, and I woke up. I stood in prayer in the morning. I called my pastor, and I told my pastor about it. He said, I need to see you right away. I went to church. My pastor was a Nigerian pastor. And he said, what did he tell you that he was going to do? I said, he told me that his father is in the hospital sick, that he's going to visit his father. The pastor said, no, that's not what he told me. He told me that his family want him to come so they can have a family reunion and fast and pray so him and I can get back together. Mm -hmm. I said, oh no, they don't like me. Only his mother don't love me. The rest of the family despise me. I don't see how that could be done. He said, well, he told you one thing, told me one thing, so you're in great danger. Mm -hmm. He said, I know my people. You are in great danger. I said, Pastor, don't worry. I'm fine. And I will be fine. I've been fasting. To make the long story short, when he came back, I went to pick him up at the airport. Already fasted for 30 days. Pray on anointing oil. Anointed my whole house inside and out. The walls, the ceiling, the windows, everywhere. I said, that witchcraft, you're not going to enter in this house. Amen. I picked him up at the airport and God distracted him to go see his girlfriend. Mm. He came home and dropped the suitcase. As soon as he left, I went in that suitcase. Yeah. Piece by piece, I got everything out. Mm. Everything he went to Nigeria and his family worked hard for it to come and kill me. Yeah. I took it out of that suitcase and uh, 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 a box full of stuff. Yeah. Mm. I called my pastor. Mm. I said, your son is back. 
And I got a lot of stuff out of his suitcase. You need to come see it. He said, is he home? I said, no. He said, well, keep those stuff and call me when he comes. He didn't come back until 3 a.m. And the pastor at 8 a.m. was at the door. Say, oh, I knew you were here. I knew you were back. I just come to say hello. We had a conversation. And the pastor said, okay, I'm leaving. I said, ah, please, pastor, don't go. I have something for you. I went and carried the box and gave it to the pastor. I said, what is this? I said, well, it's not that your son brought back from Nigeria. Oh, my God. He was shivering. Mm. He was sweating. Mm. I said, all this for nothing? The pastor took it, burned it. Hallelujah. Amen. Those that are in the church playing with God, mm -hmm. yeah. going to church, and doing church, doing the devil. Be careful. Be careful. That man almost died in the plant because of those things he was doing in the house. He was first to go to church, not me. And he did not give up all that wicked ways. And that was why when I came to church, God embraced me, hold, held me tight and said, him out of your life. Because if he had given up those things, I was going to still be with him today. Because darkness and light don't mix. No. God had to separate me from him. And I left without remorse. I left. I said, God, please, I need money to rent a room so I and my children can go live there. The Lord came in the dream and showed me how he emptied all his closets. How I came back in the house one day and his closet was empty. And I was in the house. Amen. I said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I trust you. Amen. I have no money. I said, I'm going to trust you. Mm -hmm. And it happened. Mm -hmm. One day I was in the church. The pastor was praying, but preaching, and I was crying. I got in the church that morning. I was crying, and every believer was coming. Oh, pastor, assistant, I feel it's going to be okay. Because everybody knew that him and I was about to break up. Mm -hmm. And I was in the church every day. I was crying. Every believer was coming, tapping on my shoulder. Oh, sister, you'll be fine. Sister, you'll be fine. And I got tired of it. Mm. I got tired of people patting on my shoulder. I sat in the church, I'm crying. I said, God, you got to stop this patting on my shoulder. You got to stop these tears. The pastor is preaching. I'm not listening to what he's preaching, but I'm talking to God. I said, I'm tired of crying. And at some point, I even hold my back. I said, I'm going home. You don't stop these tears, and you don't stop that patting on my shoulder. I'm not coming back to this church. Pick up my bag and I left in the middle of the service. As soon as I got home, my son said, Mom, did you meet Daddy up the street? I said, No. Oh, he was just right here. He moved all his stuff. Wow. <laughs> my dream come true, right? Mm -hmm. Took out the long story short. The house we bought in both our names. And at this point, I'm not living because the Lord told me. Mm -hmm. I know I'm staying. I don't know how God is going to do it. But God did it for me. Let me cut it short. Hallelujah. God designed a new program out here. And I was qualifying that program. And I believe that God did that program because of me. Amen? And I stayed in the house. So what are we sharing? Christian, stop playing church. Stop religion. Stop thinking that because you step foot in the church you are sick. No, it's not because you go to church every Sunday that you are sick. It is about repentance. Yes. All the wicked things that you do, visiting witchcraft, voodoo's, and all that stuff, you got to give it up. Because Jesus Christ is more powerful than those things. Yes. If Jesus Christ can show me the witchcraft in the house, uh -huh. if Jesus Christ can kill a man in the plane and wake him up, because a faithful servant of God cried and said, no, give him back his life. There is nothing impossible in your life that God cannot do. Amen. That's what keeps me going. Amen. I was called three years after I gave my life to, to Christ, three years later, and God asked me to start a church. Before God called me, there were every indication that I was called, but everybody saw it but me. In that church, if there is where one person that the pastor can count on, it was me. 
I was the first to come and the last to leave. I even designed a program, give to a pastor so I can be in church seven days a week. <laughs> the fellowship prayer night was the one Friday, last Friday of the month. I went to the pastor, I said, no, 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 no. Why, why do we pray only one Friday? He said, people will not come. I said, well, I'll come. I'll come and lock the door and stay in there by myself and pray. I said, I'll do that, pastor, I'll do that. He looked at me. I said, pastor, please, let's do it every Friday. He said, every Friday? This woman is so hungry, she's gonna kill us. <laughs> yes, I say, every Friday, I have the key. And how did I get the key? Because I took the key to clean the church. I was going there every Saturday to clean the church. Because I already have the key, I said, Pastor, that's okay. I'll come here on Friday and I'll open the church and I lock the door behind me and I stay here and pray. Yeah. I didn't just clean the church. I pray on every seat. In our church, mm. I wipe every seat, I wipe everything in the church. Mm. Sit there after I clean, lie down the floor, sleep there with God, and pray mm. for the church. I'm tired and I go home. 